So, I had a demo prepared for today. I tested it at home, but I didn't test it on the department's Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi here uses Mac filtering. And the way I have my VM set up um, <laughs> prevents me from doing it here. So I'm gonna have to play a YouTube video at the end. And then later at home, I'm gonna record a demo of my demo and put it on the website. So the outline for today's talk is we're gonna go over SSL and TLS and cover its history, its flaws, the important attacks, and I guess the lessons learned or ignored um, from all of its faults. And then we're gonna go over um, attacks for it. Uh, SSL strip is what I wanted to demo. Uh, there's also SSL sniff and some other crypto attacks that came out very recently. Does anyone have any questions about homework or anything covered so far? Um, the, uh, the drop day for this semester, I believe, is tomorrow, in case anyone was considering it. Um, and if you have any questions about your grades, don't know what they are, they're all on Blackboard right now. We only have 12% of the final grade covered so far. Okay. <clears throat> So SSL is Secure Socket Slayer. It was developed by Netscape. It is the predecessor to TLS. It is essentially a cryptographic protocol that provides secure communication over the internet. The encryption is done at the application layer. I list the TCP IP model as opposed, uh, opposed to the OSI model. I guess conceptually, the encryption in the OSI model would occur at the session layer. Because, and perhaps the presentation layer because the browser handling of SSL also provides that little presentation of either that lock on the URL bar or that green uh, little segment to the left basically saying, this is Microsoft verified, you know, signed by VeriSign. This is a valid certificate. Your browser trusts this. <coughs> so <clears throat> essentially, there's three parts to it. There's a first initial handshake to set up SSL. And then there's another, the second handshake that uses asymmetric cryptography to establish a session key. And this session key is a symmetric key. And so the third part of SSL, this TLS, is basically that the last part is a final handshake that begins the rest of the communication for the session over uh, a symmetrically encrypted channel using that session key. So it also provides, also uses in that, in the remainder of communication message authentication codes to, to provide message integrity. TLS is transport layer security. It's defined in RFC 5246. It is seen as the <coughs> successor to SSL but it's actually derived from an earlier version of SSL. It is basically, in theory, the same as SSL, conceptually. It's basically a cryptographic protocol that provides secure communication over the internet, and the encryption happens at the application layer. It uses asymmetric cryptography to establish a key, and that key is a symmetric key, and that symmetric key is used to uh, basically provide encryption to establish confidentiality for the rest of the communication. It also uses message authentication codes for message integrity. These two things are used everywhere. They're used in web browsers, they're used in email. Apparently Wikipedia says they're used in internet faxing. I'm not sure if that even still exists. Um, they're used in instant messaging, they're used in voice over IP and other things. So. SSL came from the 1990s, the early 90s, basically the dawn of time. And it was developed by the engineers at Netscape who were tasked with the almost insurmountable task of providing a protocol to making, for making secure HTTP requests. At the time, there was very little known really about how best to secure protocols. There were no best practices. There were no uh, good examples, academic examples on Here's a protocol we've established, here's an attack. Here's how we defended against it. Here's an attack against that defense, and so on and so on and so on. 
Also, they were under intense pressure to get the job done, facing common deadlines that you know, we face today, and they had to make a lot of 4 a.m. decisions. And this gave us SSL. It's actually really amazing that it lasted this long and still works as well as it does. Um, but now, the fundamental system engineered back in the 90s faces serious problems with authenticity. We're seeing, because of various events, a really diminishing trust. Hackers are much smarter than they were back in the 90s. And we also now, much more, we also now know much more about us how to secure things. So what does a secure protocol need to provide? It needs to provide secrecy. In other words, someone can't eavesdrop, over, uh, eavesdrop and find out the contents of your communication. It needs to prevent, provide integrity. It means a malicious uh, man in the middle can't manipulate your traffic, flip bits here and there, change a plus sign to a negative sign to perhaps, instead of taking money from him, have money go from you to the attacker. Um, and also needs to provide authenticity. In other words, a message sent from Alice is definitely sent from Alice. There's basically non-repudiation and uh, authenticity there. <clears throat> so here's the basics to the SSL TLS handshake. The following is sent in plain text. The client's SSL version number, his cipher settings, and session data, and along with some other stuff. The server responds with something very similar. <coughs> the server responds with its SSL version number, its cipher settings, its session data, as well as its public key certificate. <coughs> the client uses the provided certificate to authenticate the information, authenticate the server's identity. If this fails, basically the user is warned that an encrypted and authenticated, authenticated connection cannot be established. Often browsers will pop up a warning saying, uh, I cannot authenticate this certificate or this is a self-signed certificate um, that doesn't stem from one of the root certificates that we trust uh, in our browser settings. Usually users proceed anyways. So at this point, using the public key certificate, some encrypted communication begins. And this is supported by asymmetric uh, key encryption. Essentially, depending on how the cipher settings are chosen, the details here can vary. But essentially, the handshake here uh, establishes a shared uh, symmetric key. And then the remainder of the communication uses that shared symmetric key to provide confidentiality and uses message authentication codes. Uh, to provide integrity. So is the determination whether to use SSL or TLS made at the very beginning? Were they part of the negotiation? It's, it's uh, <coughs> yes, yes. It's made in the very beginning. It's uh, influenced by the, the user's browser version and that browser settings. Um, maybe it's an old version of Firefox and doesn't support the latest SSL and TLS. Um, by default, uh, the decision is used to uh, by default, the decision usually chooses the most recent version of whichever protocol uh, between the two. So if the server supports version 1, 2, and 3, and the client supports 1 and 2, but not 3 yet, they're going to choose 2. So are they, are they uh, fungible, SSL and TLS are the same? It doesn't matter which one you use? The details uh, the, really lie in the crypto. And I'm not going to delve into that. Um, you'll definitely see that in other classes, I hope. The session key is the same as long as the connections are active? Uh, it should be a new, a new symmetric key should be established every time. But like, as long as the connection is the same? Yes. The yes. <coughs> so HTTPS uses these certificates. And essentially, the certificate authorities say, this key that was provided by the server belongs to this website. And the browser <coughs> thus trusts it. So like I said, implementation details can vary. And they can definitely vary over versions. And so 
The client authenticates the server based off the server certificate. Usually the server does not require the client to authenticate itself. There's some other mechanism behind that, like there's a, you, there's a login prompt on the page that the user authenticates through, and that's totally sufficient. There are versions of SSL and TLS that require mutual authentication, but they're not going to be commonly encountered by the average web user. <clears throat> so all of this is basically automated to not involve the user. Unless the certificate is of unknown origin, it's signed by an uh, unknown uh, certificate authority or chain of certificate authorities that uh, can't be traced to a set of uh, certificate authorities that the browser trusts. So let's talk about this issue of trust. Essentially, at some point, it was decided that trust is just too hard for the normal user to think about. So the browser vendors decide basically the trust for you. It's pretty nice of them. Um, so let's, let's, let's look at the trust decided for you. So browsers, this is using just the uh, certificate information in my version of Chrome on my home machine, just a default uh, setup of Chrome. Default setup of Chrome ships with 40 trusted root certificate authorities, uh, certificates, and 25 interme intermediate certificate authorities that are trusted to sign certificates. And then always users can add their own certificates, and sometimes the default option is to just click yes. So let's think about this. Personally, I don't even know 40 people that I would trust with that information. I certainly wouldn't trust more than probably three people in my life with my banking information. And so 40 people, 40 organizations in the world are securing your banking data. Think about that for a second. So certificates are composed of a public and a private key. Now, I, sh I should mention that there was a point where there was only one root certificate authority was VeriSign. Back in the day, the internet was small and there was one root CA. And the model worked, the model made sense. You have one guy that everyone trusts and he's supposed to be basically have top secret security, impossible to hack, and it all makes sense, it all works. But now we have hundreds of certificate authorities. And that's not necessarily a problem in itself because we're approaching a billion IP addresses that are used for websites. So you can't, you can't expect one single entity to police a billion different websites to make sure that, hey, they've kept their, uh, their private key secure, they're acting uh, legitimately, they're playing by the rules. That's actually infeasible. It's impossible. So, <clears throat> before we go in further into that, we need to cover basically what certificates are. Certificates are basically composed of a public and a private key. This is essentially asymmetric key cryptography. The public key certificate, commonly referred to just as this certificate, is a digitally assigned statement that binds the value of that public key to the identity of the person, device, or service that holds the corresponding private key. It is usually supported through X509 standard certificates. It's important to note that these were designed back in the 80s. So as a result, the X509 standard is commonly perceived to be messy. It is also designed to be very flexible and very general. Throughout the years since it was introduced, people have exploited its generality and its flexibility to make certificates behave in totally wacky ways that no one actually intended them to behave. Like I said, in the 1990s, there, weren't, there was not a vast body of knowledge on how to properly secure protocols. So take it 10 years earlier, they never foresaw any of these problems occurring. And yet we still use it. So the, the art of basically binding the value of a public key to the identity of a personal service 
or device holding its private key comes down to essentially signing. Certificates can be used to sign two different things. One is to basically to provide uh, secure communication that is uh, that offers non-repudiation and authenticity. In other words, Bob sent this message. I can prove that Bob did send this message. Bob can't claim, hey, I, I didn't send that message. So that's non-repudiation. And the first part I said is I can prove Bob sent this message. That's authenticity. <clears throat> so the private key of a certificate can be used to sign a message. And then it's decrypted. Uh, or verified with the public key. So a private key can be used to sign other people's public keys, and this is how uh, certificates are established, uh, certificate chains are established in a chain of trust, essentially trust relationships. So in essence, VeriSign sus signs a certificate for Microsoft, and your browser sees that, hey, VeriSign trusts Microsoft, I trust VeriSign, thus I trust Microsoft. And this forms the foundation of the public key infrastructure. So let's talk about the public key infrastructure. It is essentially a set of hardware, software, people, and policies and procedures needed to <coughs> create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates. <coughs> now I should note, before I get all doom and gloom for the rest of the hour, that uh, certificate blacklists exist and they work. Um, it requires properly checking the blacklist, though. Some browsers may not be configured to do that as frequently as they should. So this is the topology for a general public key infrastructure. Most important part of it is a certificate authority. They are responsible for binding the public key with the respective user's identities. The user identities must be unique. Um, in theory, we, in practice, we see that uh, not being the case. Unfortunately, more <coughs> often than we desire. And the CA uses its own private key to sign the user's public key to say, hey, I trust this user. <clears throat> the validation authority, shorthanded as VA, is supposed to be a third party that exists to provide and vouch for user information. It validates that user A is who he says he is. It is involved in the registration and issuance of the certificates. The registration uh, authority exists to ensure that the public key is bound to the individual and to no one else. This ensures non-repudiation. So, certificate authorities can sign the public key for other certificate authorities saying that I, VeriSign, trust, or I, Mozilla, trust this organization to establish other trust relationships in the form of acting as the certificate authority itself. So, it shouldn't work in reverse. The model should totally fail in reverse. You should not have trust cycles. Um, trust cycles, when you're trying to validate a chain of trust, can cause an infinite loop, um, if depending on the <coughs> implementation. Also, they completely break the model. It, it just makes things not work. It logically falls apart. So this should never occur. However, if you have enough money, it can and you find the right CA that's willing to do shady stuff. Um, I won't say it on the record here, but there are some CAs out there that will sell basically some form of their root certificate uh, if you are worth at least $5 million and some other stuff. So. <clears throat> so here's the process if you own a website to get a certificate. Uh, basically one, I ask the certificate authority to issue a certificate in my name. <coughs> Two, the certificate authority validates my identity and then issues me a certificate. Three, I then present the certificate <coughs> containing my identity to the user who wants to do this with me or visit my website. Four, the user doesn't know me, so they ask the certificate authority to verify my identity. 
because the SIPI authority is mentioned in that certificate that is provided to the user. So the five, the SIPI authority checks that my certificate is valid. In other words, it hasn't been altered when the when the uh, the website owner got it, or hasn't been altered in the communication, um, and it hasn't expired. And some other checks, it hasn't been revoked um, as well. Six, after validating the certificate provided to the user, the certificate authority tells the user that that certificate is valid. And finally, the user now trusts the website. So is the, I don't see any clear, is the intermediate CA trust the user that website is? is uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the CA at the top could be an intermediate CA. That's transitively trust, trusted. Sorry. So, let's talk about getting a certificate for your website. The average website owner isn't as sophisticated as the people in this room. They aren't as aware as of the security issues uh, that users typically and, and website owners typically face on the internet. So, when shopping for basically a certificate. Back in the day, there was one certificate authority, Verisign. They could charge whatever they wanted, and they made bank. Competition was introduced, and so then the question was posed, who do I trust more, Verisign, or Party A, or Party B, to be my CA, and what is it worth to me? How do I put value to that trust? Is there some sort of metric I can use to put the level of trust I need should only cost this much money. It's a very difficult question. It's an extremely vague question because trust can really vary definition from person to person. So there's a lot of websites out there that allow you to compare the, the SSL services provided, the certification services provided uh, from CA to CA. And so the details there can differ between using 128-bit uh, encryption keys to 256-bit encryption keys to 512, 1024, and so on and so on. However, in most of the columns that's not really translated here. It's just either some vague value of low and high that's not really scientifically measurable and is used to, to describe its assurance level. Now, <clears throat> to a normal website owner, that really doesn't mean that much. Um, it doesn't mean that much to us as scientists. Uh, I might consider uh, uh, 20, 48 bit encryption keys to be low insurance for my needs. So, in essence, the website owner has to make a decision, and it's usually primarily driven by how much money am I willing to spend. Maybe next year I'll be able to afford a better one, but for now I'm not willing to uh, dole out $570 per month to secure my website. Yes? What's the 99% of the standard SSS? 99? All right here. I don't know. Huh. I do not know. <sighs> so, um, in essence, getting a certificate means forking over <coughs> money, proving your, providing identity, uh, identifying info about yourself to the CA, <coughs> and promising to play nice. This entire <coughs> transaction boils down to you are buying their trust. You can manipulate it and interpret it any other way you want, but it always boils down to you are buying their trust. There is some instances where you know there's research done about each person who's registering for a CA certificate, uh, registering for, for any certificate from a CA, you know, make sure the bad guys aren't getting them. There's, that usually it does happen. But if they can't find any bad stuff about you, it generally comes down to a decision that 
as long as they paid the money, they get their certificate. Um, there may be some standards. Uh, for some enterprise certificates, you may have to pr prove that you are a actual company that exists in a physical location, an office building has servers, has staff and personnel, and is worth at least this mu much money as a company, perhaps in publicly traded stocks and assets. So there are restrictions. But at the end of the day, you're buying their trust, as long as you meet the standards. So how do website owners decide? <coughs> really, the user doesn't notice any difference. There, they, when was the last time any of you clicked on a, uh, the, the certificate information for the website you uh, uh, visited to see it was signed by the exact same certificate chain at Root CA as last time? Right. So after all, these guys are all in the business of selling trust. They're the ones securing the internet, so they must all be trustworthy. So why not buy the cheapest? And this is essentially a common decision that has driven, a common decision that has shaped the nature of the public key infrastructure market. Because the market can't decide it's the actual value. There cannot really be any hard assignment of this much trust is worth this much dollar. So naturally, market forces drive it to the people who offer trust for the cheapest get the most customers. So who can become a certificate authority? Any ideas? You? Me? Anyone, really? So, what's the problem here? The problem is when you visit a website and say they're their own certificate authority and they sign their own certificate, it's self-signed, you get a warning. You, the warning says this is a self-signed certificate. Probably 99% of users proceed anyways. So, yes? This is true. The, the CS systems... Uh, uh, here are using a self-signed certificate and honestly I can't fault them there and I'll tell you guys why later um, when I cover the disasters that have happened in the certificate authority world um, because we avoid using what I perceive as a bad one yes it's not self-signed not anymore no it's never self-signed self-signed or it's signed by a place that we need to search for free for EDU space. Oh, so we use a free CA that we don't have to pay any money. Yes. <laughs> as long as, okay. Free for EDU space. Free for .edu. Even better. So the problem with being a CA is that you have to get someone to trust you. Now, you already got 90% of all people because they'll just trust you anyways and click yes. <laughs> but we want to get the last 10%. And so we need to take a step back and look at the big picture and look at the hurdle of securing the internet. So this is a recent uh, graph taken from the Internet Systems Consortium. And we're approaching one billion internet domains. They're definitely not all secured by SSL. If you took one billion and multiplied it by the price of the cheapest uh, Civic authority that's probably not free. Say it costs 50 bucks. That's a $50 billion industry. It's definitely not that big. That's a huge, huge price to pay for securing the internet. <clears throat> and then you get into the details of some people want to be more secure than others, so they pay more money, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just a fuzzy number. So back <laughs> in the day, when there was one civic authority, the task of securing the internet was easier, definitely, than it is today. We can't expect a handful of certificate authorities to secure one billion identities to make sure that each one of the one billion applicants is who they actually say they are. They don't have a bad background. They actually exist. Their company actually exists in a physical location. They have staff and, you know, 
after they get the certificate, they don't just dissolve everything because it was all front. So that requires constant monitoring. So this is a, this is a hard problem. And so when CA started to sign other CAs, we saw an explosion of trust. Now essentially what happened is a network that looks like this. You have a root CA that signs for an intermediate CA, and the, that CA says, you can all be certificate authorities, join the party, it's a cool thing to do. Meanwhile, that old root CA was like, I remember being a CA before it was cool. So this is how it works in practice. Certificate authorities, especially the root CAs, are the single point of failure in the system. They're top target for hackers. And they look really bad if they get hacked. So they just brush it under the rug if it happens. Sometimes. <sighs> Validation authorities? Huh? In practice, given the number of certificate authorities out there, probably don't even exist most of the time. Probably not even a, uh, uh, a task of an intern working at that CA. Now the registration authority, probably, probably sometimes that work is done by an intern working at CA. Um, it's supposed to be a three, third party, same with validation <laughs> authority. And that intern probably just keeps an eye out for bad things when he's not getting coffee. So the problem is doing everything right costs money and you're always competing with the lowest bidder because market forces are driving all the customers towards the lowest cost service. <laughs> the pricing is all completely artificial anyways. What is trust? How do you put value in trust? How, how do you actually tie it to something, some monetary value? Something printed on paper. Is something printed on paper exchangeable with the trust I would have in someone protecting my family? The trust I would have in maybe the police? The trust I have in my bank to have proper physical security, armed guards, and insurance to ensure that if they get robbed, all my money isn't lost? How do, you, how, do you, how do you put value in that? It's all artificial. <coughs> and as we will see, that there are absolutely zero consequences most of the time when everything goes wrong. So it's like one of the best businesses to get into, at least if you're a CA. There are some instances that we'll talk about where everything went wrong and they went completely bankrupt. <coughs> so <coughs> let's talk about the blues. In the 80s, the X509 certificates standard was designed. <coughs> it was designed to be flexible in general. That was great at the time. Now it's horrible. It was also, back then and still is now, ugly as hell. And it has a long history of implementation vulnerabilities because it's a messy standard. Messy standards are hard to implement because they're hard to understand. All developers are basically not created equal, so they come to a problem with a different skill set, a different way of looking at things logically, and they come out usually with a slightly different understanding of the concept, problem, or model. So this leads to implementation differences, which leads often to vulnerabilities. Then in the 1990s, SSL was conceived by Netscape. And uh, I strongly urge you all to do the, to <coughs> do the required reading, which is just watch a 30 minute video uh, of a DEF CON talk given by Moxie Marlin Spike um, on how broken SSL is. Um, he actually went and interviewed, he, 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 he found out the engineering team that actually put together SSL. Found one of the guys, the core team leader basically, and the guy hadn't been on the internet for the past 15 years. So he found him in a phone book and called him. And he interviewed him. And I'm paraphrasing at this point. He asked him about SSL and certificate authorities and how that was all thought up. And the guy said, quote unquote, well, it was all actually a bit of a hand wave. These are, these are not the security vulnerabilities you're looking for. <coughs> so fast forward to today. In 2009, there were three major vulnerabilities uh, that affected the whole world just due to certificate authority mistakes. Oops, I published my private key in my public HTML directory. 
in 2010, uh, due to efforts and research done by the, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, there is, I guess, growing evidence of governments compelling certificate authorities to do their building, bidding. If a certificate authority exists in Russia, the Russian government can compel a certificate authority to do its bidding, hand over your private key. In China, same thing. In the United States, the same thing. Now, it's becoming actually common for uh, uh, governments to own their own, own and run their own certificate authorities. And these make it into the trusted authorities run by a browser. So, let's have a little intermission and peruse uh, this nice diagram provided by the SSL Observatory. This is run by the EFF. It's a charitable organization, basically all about internet security, uh, rights, and defending uh, vulnerability researchers and hackers. Um, they're a really interesting organization. Uh, and I, last summer, I got my mohawk for charity for them. Um, so uh, this PDF is a map of, remember that explosion of CAs? This is the resulting explosion of CAs from just two of those 40 root certificates. So this is CAs that have resulted from a chain of trust stemming from either Mozilla or Microsoft. And it is massive. And arrows are going everywhere. And there are some interesting players in this list. I'm surely never going to find them here in the demo. Um, there's Ford Motor Company. There's something just called Government CA. I mean, I don't have to scroll far to get some really weird ones. Then there's TX3CX. Not What? Do you trust that person? <laughs> Would you trust that person securing your bank? <coughs> How about C equals AT, ST equals Australia? Austria. Right. Do you trust hex? How about hex code? <laughs> I mean, that looks legit. Is, wait, where? Is there... Oh, no, no, I was just thinking... Oh, no. And somehow, VeriSign <laughs> is signed by Mozilla and Microsoft. I don't even understand how that works. Did VeriSign have arrows going to itself? Self-signed. Self Ah, perhaps that's it. Ah, so yes, yeah, so <coughs> that's, that's probably the case. Um, however, let's see. I spelled it wrong. It's right here on their front page. So uh, right here they say, and you can also peruse our second map of the 650 odd organizations that function as certificate authorities that are trusted directly or indirectly by Mozilla or Microsoft. Uh, let's see. Let's follow this source and see one. Okay, so hexagon means uh, is a root CA trusted by Microsoft only. So yeah, and Microsoft or Mozilla products. This is correct. So this is 650 people or entities that out of the box with Mozilla or Microsoft products, you are set up to trust. <coughs> Here we go. <sighs> Let's see if we can find some more interesting ones. Um, a lot of European ones. <laughs> Bypass? <laughs> AOL Time Warner, yep. Japan Services. <clears throat> so, let's look at that key again. So, box means a root certificate trusted by both in their products. Diamond means a root certificate trusted by Mozilla. And hexagon means a root certificate trusted by Microsoft. Microsoft 
basically every large garden has Yes. But it may not, well, I, and this is for general products, so that, that should be true too. Um, but as you can see, it's kind of a mess. And to say to the average user that you are expected out of the box to trust these people can be seen as kind of preposterous. Um, I certainly don't even trust 40 people to act as root CAs. However, <laughs> there's problems with narrowing it down. The internet has grown to a totally international thing. Back in the day when it was VeriSign, VeriSign perhaps signed the certificates and <laughs> the majority all in the United States or all in North America. So there's very little international political problems. And so we see in this list that there's all these foreign, obviously foreign certificates that your browser set up to trust. The customers of Microsoft and Mozilla are all over the world. And websites run in, say, Russia, probably wouldn't trust a certificate authority that's stationed in the United States and could potentially, potentially be subject to US law and uh, coercion. And the very similarly, you know, customers in Russia would probably also, some of them would not trust certificate authorities established even in Russia. The same for the United States. Many Americans wouldn't trust anything signed by anything involving the US government that they could be involved uh, with the US government. So about that trust. It's a bit of a mess. So here's some interesting certificate authorities on this list. The US Department of Homeland Security, some US defense contractors, CNNIC, which is, uh, stands for China Internet Network Information Center, uh, Ediselat, Ed, which is a major telecommunications corporation run in the UAE. Uh, I think they're the fifth largest uh, telecommunications corporation in the world. And also the island of Bermuda. The island of Bermuda can secure the internet. That's interesting. So this brings me to scoping issues. Maybe DHS should just sign for sites in the United States. And likewise, state-run <coughs> certificate authorities in China should just sign for sites in China. However, like I mentioned, naturally there's going to be citizens who don't trust the authorities run in their own country. I mean, and you can't fault them. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions. And things are different around the world. So about securing the internet. It's kind of messy. What are, what are we to do, really? I mean, as a browser vendor, I would have to have it set up so customers around the world would be able to use the internet in the same way as everyone else. So I'd have to have a diverse set of certificate authorities that the browser would trust. So things don't get broken in Germany, so things don't get broken in South America, and so on. <coughs> and on top of that, there could be uh, policies and laws in nations that require certificate authorities uh, to be used uh, in certain ways. Like you can't use, as a citizen of Germany, you cannot use certificate authorities existing in these countries. Or you must use certificate <coughs> authorities in this list. So you have to be mindful of those potential policies. So once you start adding international law to the mix, it becomes a mess. Um, and to give you a perspective on how absolutely insane international cyber law is, I uh, this is off the top of my head because I don't remember specifics, but uh, many North, American, uh, North African countries as well as Middle Eastern countries came together and signed a treaty, rather a pact, stating that if one of the citizens in their own country breaks a cyber law in one of the treaty members' countries, they can be ex extradited 
for prosecution there. What if you have a religious law based on uh, profanity and decency and it extends to cyberspace? Your daughter's <coughs> spring bake pictures might end her up in a Turkish prison or some other prison. So that's, that's off topic, but that's just to give you perspective is how crazy this can get. So about securing the internet. Let's go over some important certificate authority attacks. Now in this first slide, I used attacks in quotes, you know, finger quotes, because the following people that we know about so far were just able to obtain major certificates without any hacking. Mike Zussman <coughs> obtained login.live.com, which is run by Microsoft, because he just asked for it. He didn't provide any fraudulent information. They're just like, okay, here. There's no VA or RA in the mix. It was already a uh, 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 certificate provided to existing user, and they gave it to this Mike Zussman guy. And all he was doing was security research. He apparently didn't have to do much research, really, at all, to prove that, hey, the system doesn't work. Question, yes. Do you mean that they're paying the signing fee, or are you talking about the uh, I think uh, the signing key. Um, Eddie Nig was able to do the same with Mozilla.com. No validation authority stopped him. He was simply investigating unethical CA practices and basically hit the jackpot on his first try. And so you can read about that there. Then, at some other point, VeriSign issued a code signing certificate for the entity Microsoft Corporation, oh, and unknowingly to unknown hackers that still have not been found out today. This allowed them to sign uh, kernel mode drivers, Windows updates, applications, etc. And now let's talk about actual attacks. Um, a really noteworthy one was in 2010, RSA got hacked. It's not really SSL, but they, RSA sold a service called Secure ID. <laughs> In essence, this is providing the same thing SSL does. a secure communications protocol that provides secrecy, integrity, and authentication. And in this model, there's one root certificate authority, RSA. Now, in 2010, this totally makes sense. If I'm a Fortune 500 company, I don't want to use the CA <coughs> system, and I can probably afford the best and brightest to work in my corporation. So everyone in the room realizes that, yes, this system is broken. We need something that's easier to lock down and easier to trust. So this became a popular program. However, when RSA was hacked, Secure ID was compromised. And essentially, a massive hack hit 760 companies. 20% of the companies were on the <coughs> Fortune, 5, Fortune 100 list. Not 20%. I'm sorry, because that math doesn't add up. It hit 20% of the Fortune 100 list. So 20 companies on the Fortune 100. Because 20% of 760 is, well, you can do the math. So it also hit many more of the Fortune 500. It hit Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and you can read about it here. <coughs> Which brings me to Komodo. The reason we're going to talk about Komodo so much is solely because of the drama. Um, when Komodo got hacked in March 2011, it was a big deal. Um, they came out and news reports stated that Komodo suspects that it was hacked by Iran. <clears throat> it's a pretty bold claim. Attribution when getting hacked is hard. People can be behind proxies. IPs can be spoofed. People can move around. People can hack others and frame them. So. They outright claimed that they believe <coughs> that Iran hacked them. And they published the IP ad address for the hacker and the longitude and latitude, and this is in Iran. The attacker made off with some important certs that allowed them to sign things. Mail.google.com, Google.com, login.yahoo.com, login.skype.com, and etc. Immediately after the attack was discovered, the CEO issued the following statement. This attack was 
extremely sophisticated and critically executed. It was very well orchestrated, a very clinical attack, and the attacker knew exactly what they needed to do and how fast they had to operate. <clears throat> so again, I urge you to watch the video for today because it covers this in depth. <coughs> he also claimed that all the IP addresses involved in the attack were in Iran, and this sparked a debate on cyber war. So Komodo secures about 25% of the internet. If one state was to compromise 25% of the internet, imagine what they could do. They could do a lot. They could attack a lot of people. They could have a lot of power. And he went on to say, uh, in a later statement, after many statements, the following. All of the above leads us to one conclusion only, that this was likely to be a state-driven attack. So, drama. Because now you're talking about, essentially, cyber. And so this is all cited from this URL. So, after the first CEO statement, that the attacker posted something on Pacemen. Um, and it was basically a response to the CEO. And he posted many following responses to the CEO. <coughs> and rambled a lot. Um, he is either, I, I believe, the majority of his responses are uh, impacted by uh, knowing buzzwords and having bad English. Um, because it's my opinion that it was just a script kitty who can talk a really big game. Because he's strung together technical concepts and attack concepts that don't make sense. Um, and I urge you to check out the ramblings because it's actually pretty hilarious. So surely there must be consequences to something like this. An amateur breaking 25% of the internet. And Komodo got attacked three times later that year. Surely something happened to Komodo, right? I mean, we place a lot of trust in them. They're securing your bank account. I mean, if you had money in a bank downtown and 25% of your money was just stolen and they were caught and they're investigated, I mean, wouldn't you do business with someone else? So, turned out nothing happened. <coughs> no one cared. And the CEO of Komodo was named Entrepreneur of the Year at RSA 2011. No consequences. It's like you're too big to fail. Which brings us to DigiNoter. DigiNoter ran into an issue when it noticed that it signed a rogue star.google.com certificate. And this was presented to a number of users in Iran. When this came to the attention of DigiNoter, because it didn't intentionally issue this certificate, they quickly revoked it. And they claimed hackers. So if an attacker did this, which it turns out an attacker did, they were able to compromise the private key for DigiNoter. And they were able to sign any certificate. And DigiNoter is a root CA that, at the time, your browser trusted. It was one of those 40. This particular case is important because the entire Dutch government runs off of DigiNoter certificates. So the attackers were able to compromise the entire Dutch government. So, problem? Even if they didn't attach, <laughs> attack the, the, the great people of the Netherlands, it still poses a serious problem and is a big wake-up call. What if this happened to the entire American government or the entire government of China or the entire and so on and so on? So <coughs> this time the attacker posted more stuff on Pacemen and uh, he named himself as Komodo Hacker saying it's the same guy, I'm super elite, I can do SOAP and LDAP and I can, I can O-Day <coughs> your MOBO and fear me. Um, and I have tons of SSL certs. I can sign for anything. 
Yes. But when you say the entire Dutch government uses digital, do you mean that they're public facing sites using digital? Yes. Or do they use it internally? Uh, if they use it internally, those details would be classified and I wouldn't be able to comment because I wouldn't know. So what happened is the Dutch government took seized the company and took over it. That same month, the company was declared bankrupt. So the lesson learned here is if you're a CA, you can often be too big to fail. However, when you fail, if you cause someone bigger than you to fail, then you're screwed. It's game over. So, essentially, this was highlighted as a complete compromise of the CA system. Um, and 2011 was a bad year. In uh, Israel, uh, Startcom, or yeah, Startcom was uh, rumored to be breached. I don't think it actually happened. Global Sign was also a rumored to be breached by the same hacker that got DigiNoter, um, but the reports concluded there was no evidence of any breach. So it, it, I'm bringing these rumors up because it's important to notice to note that in a network of trust, rumors can diminish the actual trust. And think about how that should affect your decisions. If you were to make these decisions on your own, Right? <coughs> if there's some rumor that, say, you're, you're working with your teammate and his system's just got completely hacked and you're working on stuff that's for your master's thesis or dissertation, and it can all get stolen, you probably wouldn't share any more information with him. However, we'll talk about that later. So another important thing that I want to talk about, not because it happened, but because, but because of how it was handled, was VeriSign was repeatedly hacked in 2010. When they were discovered by a security and incident response team, the CEO and the, the management was not notified. Okay, I got 10 minutes left. <clears throat> so there was no public statement. In fact, there never was any public statement made by VeriSign saying, sorry customers, we were hacked. Now it's important to note at the time, in the summer of 2010, VeriSign sold its SSL business to Symantec, but no one really knows when the attacks began in 2010. So maybe. VeriSign, at the time, was when it had its SSL business, was secured over 50% of the internet, which means .com, .net, .gov. Essentially, an attacker with a signing certificate for those uh, domains, for those top-level domains, could impersonate almost any company on the internet. So these reports came out only because new SEC guidelines required reporting security breaches to in in investors. These new guidelines have subsequently resulted in an explosion of reports and filings about security breaches and breach risks. And you can read about that on this Reuters post. So VeriSign also runs other important services like DNS and their DNS system processes 50 billion queries a day. So instead of going to google.com, if I compromise that as a hacker, I can make you go to a website that I have malware that will own your box, just by visiting it, perhaps. So at that scale, being able to own the internet, people start throwing around the word cyber. And cyber to politicians means, oh my god, cyber war. I don't understand anything about this because it's all a series of tubes. And you're pumping like corrosive acid down my tubes and clogging it up and destroying things. And I don't get it. So <clears throat> attacks at this scale would be extremely valuable to advanced persistent threats. Um, advanced persistent threats need not be state organized or state-run. It could be a well-resourced and well-established underground group that really knows what it's doing. It's perhaps made of all ex-government special forces and really good people that just, you know, want to make a ton of money by robbing everyone blind. So <coughs> let's get back to the problem of secure protocol. So 
problem with SSL and secrecy is everyone's a CA nowadays. Um, I guess everyone attended that one episode on Oprah and I missed out. Um, there's really no accountability for CAs unless they cause an entire government to fail. Um, and authenticity is, you could probably just ask for someone else's certificate and you might get it. There's no harm in even asking. They're going to tell you yes or no. So this is a good quote that I want to end this section of the lecture on, is that the security of HTTPS is only as strong as the practices of the least trustworthy and competent certificate authority. The EFF's SSL Observatory posted this map uh, claiming that these are the countries that can intercept secure communications. Basically, these, com these countries can strip SSL, can decrypt SSL on any communications they want. So the flaw with this is that, think back to those rumors of these CAs getting hacked. We can't actually adapt to those problems. We can't change anything. We're locked into these trust relationships. Now when Komodo got hacked, the browsers could have dropped Komodo. However, they probably would have looked worse than Komodo because they just broke 25% of the internet. Now, also the problem with this is that market forces reward the cheapest trust vendors. And it's only natural that we're seeing an increase in CAs getting hacked. Now just imagine the ones that don't get detected and don't get reported. <coughs> the problem with the current model is also there's no agility. We cannot adapt to disturbances in the force. And the trust becomes forever, basically. So for the third time, I'm going to urge you to watch the video that I've assigned because it's completely related on uh, this entire debate as well as trust agility. So there are some advisories on how to defend against a broken CA system. But in summary, it's really complicated. It means just be prepared to use another CA. So um, I have to make a quick mention to convergence.io. Um, it's a Firefox plugin that uses trust agility, which basically allows you to be free from the CA system. So I'm going to quickly end the lecture with, uh, uh, if I have time, with covering uh, attacks on SSO without having to pick on the easy targets of the CA system. So, to recap, basically you have this first handshake, then you establish the symmetric key using the asymmetric key encryption, the public key crypto, and then basically you begin symmetric key uh, encrypted communication. So there are tools for breaking this. Um, SSL strip is what I had a demo for today, but the Wi-Fi here broke it, so I'll release a demo on my own. But for the meantime, I'm going to show you a YouTube video that's just two minutes on how, do you, how it's done and what happens. Um, basically uses art poisoning to perform a man-in-the-middle attack on uh, ignorant users. So it reduces HTTPS to HTTP. <coughs> so you no longer get that lock and green icon at the top of your, your URL bar saying this is trusted. It just looks normal. Normal HTTP, so there's no warning. SSL sniff is you get a uh, CA cert, say you've hacked Komodo and got their cert. You plug it into SSL sniff and you can decrypt all SSL and TLS traffic, um, as long as you see that establishment of the symmetric key. Beast and crime are worth mentioning because Beast was proposed by Giuliano Rizzo and Tai Duong. I'm not sure if I even pronounced the names right. But the first one attacks TLS 1.0 and 1.1, and crime came out uh, late 2012, late last year. And attacks all versions of TLS and SSL, and the details are unknown, and they're working with basically the browsers to fix them. So SSL strip is a simple tool um, to attack a target. You need five commands. Um, you need to be on the same network as your victim. So usually you'd be an attacker would be in like a coffee shop, somewhere somewhere with open Wi-Fi. They need to be able to ARP spoof the victim. And what they're going to do is they're going to impersonate the gateway. Now, that's going to be a problem in Wi-Fi because the signal strength 
uh, the AP may win out if it's closer to the victim and it's naturally messier in Wi-Fi. However, uh, I'll show you a demo without Wi-Fi. So <clears throat> basically what you do is once you ARP spoof and you impersonate the gateway, the victim starts sending all this traffic to you thinking you're the gateway. What you do is you basically forward it to the legitimate gateway and you have basically proxy control over the traffic. So once you're able to intercept all the traffic, what SSL strip does is it looks for outgoing get requests to the web server that have <coughs> HTTPS in the packet and simply replaces any mention of HTTPS with HTTP. Now, I'm going to pull up this. <coughs> So basically the first thing you need to do is you need to establish uh, IP forwarding in your IP tables. And I'll post all the commands and point you guys to a tutorial so you can do it. Essentially what happens when you're not attacking a user, you go to a website that doesn't have strict transport security enabled, and say the login page will say HTTPS as normal. Now if username and password place to log in, right? So what happens when you uh, ARP spoof them, run SSL strip, and to degrade the, uh, the communication from HTTPS to HTTP is uh, when that user sends out the username and password, if they don't notice that, hey, this isn't HTTPS in the URL, in plain text, you will get the username and password, neither the get or post. Uh, data sent from the client to the server. So what's going on here in this window is that he's performing an ARP spoof, basically sending ARP packets saying, who is the gateway? I am the gateway, <coughs> constantly directly to the target. This is a targeted ARP spoof, and what it's doing is it's uh, overriding the ARP cache for the victim. So the victim has basically always a cache running of uh, ARP responses it sees. So it can keep a uh, efficient glimpse and snapshot of the network. So if you flood it with bogus ARP packets, it's going to replace the value in the cache with whatever is most recent. You send it enough packets, this is guaranteed to happen. So <clears throat> now you see the victim's trying to log in and he's sending all his traffic to the, the attacker. The attacker has, when the, Google, when the user types in google.com uh, slash accounts, uh, instead of returning HTTPS, it returns HTTP. And the user enters in his username and password if he falls for it, and this gets logged. And the attacker is uh, here uh, printing out the log. It's just SSL strip.log. And you can see email and password being sent and essentially the get request. So essentially he can log in as the user. So um, the way to defend against this is to be a smart user, but for a website is to have your website run strict transport security. This means SSL on all pages. Many websites do not do this, and there's no excuse for them not doing this. The only reason they don't do this is because they are completely incompetent. There's been a lot of debate that I can't, I as a business, if I have SSL on all my pages, it's going to slow down all my traffic, and everyone's going to leave me for my competitor, and they're not running SSL, and you know everyone knows that lag kills business. So about a year or two ago, Google... <coughs> considered this argument and implemented SSL on all of its services. It saw less than a 0 0.02 impact on all of its performance. If your engineers are telling you that we can't do SSL, it's because they've everything's been engineered basically wrong. You need to rethink things. It shouldn't take up uh, appreciable, it shouldn't uh, impact your performance in any appreciable way. So. With strict transport security, basically a TV request for your, to your server, even if I'm running SSL strip and I'm intercepting your traffic and I'm modifying it to say, hey server, get me HTTPS, and I replace it with 
get HTTP, the server will respond with the HTTPS request anyways, because it doesn't serve up HTTP uh, plain text. So another thing is SSL sniff. Like I said, if you if bad guys hack a certificate authority and get a certificate, uh, basically a private key, they can plug it into SSL sniff and just decrypt SSL and TLS traffic on the fly and get the uh, symmetric keys. It cannot be defended against. Basically, the defense is to not have a broken certificate authority system. We can all hope for a miracle. And so Beast um, was a crypto uh, attack on SSL, or rather TLS versions 1.0 and 1.1 back in 2011, and it can strip HTTPS cookies from a session. And it takes less than 10 minutes on their paypal.com um, uh, demo. So the defense is to use the latest versions. Crime, I don't know anything about. They came out with it just last year. It's the same team, and it works against all versions. So that is the end for today. Uh, for the next lecture, I'm modifying the topic. We're going to continue uh, with web application hacking and shell code. Um, I'm replacing the topic, so don't do the readings that I've listed for it just yet. Um, if it still talks about penetration testing, like 101, don't do it. Uh, we're going to cover web application firewalls, and we're going to cover uh, shell code, especially connect back shell code and uh, uh, encoded shell code to get past web application firewalls filters. So that is the end. Any questions? <coughs>